Ladies and gentlemen, it's all my great honor to attend this uh, annual meeting of TMEC. I also appreciate uh, that Professor D would like to give us a, a talk. I, I think Professor D all body well known is people because the, he also is the founders with TMEC, a page. And he is a good friend of Professor D. I see the Professor Lee many times and Peng Wang come from Taipei Veteran General Hospital. Today, the gift talk is very, very impressive. That means that when we manage the surgical disease, we use the conventional explorer parotomy more invasive and uh, improve to minimal invasive surgery. However, if no surgery can be done, just like medicine or some technique, it can improve the symptom control to deal with the many kinds of the surgical candidate disease. I think it is good, good choice. So now we welcome Professor Lee give us a talk about the high food in the use of the benign uterine disease. Thank you. Please. Thank you. Uh, Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, uh, Professor Wong. Uh, can you see me? Yeah. Can yeah. you hear me? So I share the screen first. Uh, okay. Uh, I, I, the topic I, I've given this topic before sometime in August, but because I'm now speaking to uh, laparoscopic and endoscopic surgeons, I put a little uh, two here, which means it's a lecture slightly different from the earlier one I gave in August. Again, let me just introduce my friends from APH. Uh, without them, I also would not be here today. Uh, this is Professor Harry Rich, and this is Professor Li Chi Long. Uh, Professor Prashan is the present elect of uh, APH now. Uh, I'm actually standing right behind here. This is a recent picture taken in 2019 in July in Chongqing. Uh, it so happens just coincidentally, uh, this row of uh, senior doctors, uh, Professor Li Qilong, Felix Wong, Hong Kong, myself, uh, Selva from Malaysia, this is Hugo from uh, Germany, and this is Professor Cheng, I think all of you know, uh, we are all interested in Haifu. This picture I must show again because I'm very proud to be given a comment memento by Dr. Ye, the time he was the president of APH. Uh, what's important on stage was the president of the Taiwan. Okay, uh, one of the recent uh, uh, M meetings we have, we signed a memor memorandum of understanding uh, with regards to Haifu training, education, research and certification. This was uh, done by Professor Li Qilong and uh, the president of East Miss. Uh, this was done in July. So certification from now onwards will be under the purview of APH, which is a very honorable, uh, responsible thing to do. Now, uh, Fibroid adenomyosis surgery, usually we say how to do it. It's either in simple terms, it's either open surgery or keyhole surgery, MIS. And in myomectomy, the main concerns, main concerns are bleeding, that you have to convert to a hysterectomy, uh, especially when you when you the patient expects to have uh, to conserve the womb, and but because of bleeding, we have to convert to the hysterectomy to save the patient. The next major uh, worry in uh, myomectomy is adhesions. And the last one, major one is, will the scar rupture during pregnancy? So this has been a headache for many of us uh, in gynecology for many years. I have the fourth one here, I put risk of undiagnosed leiomyosarcoma. This one, I'll comment about it later, but this one in my, in my mind, it's actually, this one in my mind is actually, a, I call it a self-inflicted injury. That means the doctors created this problem. 
the other methodology we use to treat fibroids is our drugs, uh, ulipistrol acetate. Uh, the brand is Aspirin in Singapore. This has already been banned. And then what is being used by our international radiologists is uterine artery embolization, which occasionally we still use that. And of course, the most common we normally advise patients is the fibroid is asymptomatic, small to observe. Now, this is probably my journey, a so personal journey, how from open surgery, laparotomy to laparoscopy cure surgery, and now to really scarless surgery. So even to me, your single port and your nodes, they, there's a scar there, but they are hidden scars or invisible scars. But this one is truly scarless. Now, why do we doctors have to... Uh, bend our back, you know, to strain ourselves to, for smaller scars, that's because we want our patients to have less pain, able to recover quickly, able to go back to normal housework, and also to ensure that whatever we do, there should be less complication compared to conventional surgery. So this is our calling, and our calling should be second nature in every one of us. Now, like a magnifying glass, we can focus the light to a point where, whereby it produces heat to burn. Haifu uses sound. And we can actually focus sound to a point whereby it produces heat to destroy the tissue. And sound has no radiation. Sound has no fusa. So it can be focused on a tissue to, cr uh, to create heat to destroy or ablate tissues like a fibroid, like adenomyosis. So high intensity focus ultrasound is, the intensity is about 800 times what we use in diagnostic ultrasound we do for our bedside ultrasound uh, diagnosis of maternity cases or gynae cases. And it's very important to be able to focus the point to an intensity of heat about 65 degrees centigrade to 100 degrees centigrade. Reason is, if there's anything below 60 degrees, you only get a warming effect. Uh, so anything below 60 degrees, 40 degrees, 30 degrees, you are actually, um, like the Japanese say, in the onzen, power chuan, the 40 degrees C. So it doesn't create any uh, damage to the tissue or ablation to the tissue. So to create a cross cell death, you need something really way above 60 degrees centigrade. So the choice of uh, the technology or the machine, you have to focus on what you're going to use. And by ablation, it causes a mechanical effect like cavitation, which bursts the, the cells and or coagulates the cells. So in my opinion, Haifu, will be a procedure that will change our practice of gynecology and it will add a new dimension to treatment of fibroids and adenomyosis. Now, HIFU has been experimented long ago, since 1942, but it was not until 1988, Professor Wang and his team sets up a research center to relook into HIFU for mankind. And in year 2000, finally, he got the approval from uh, the Chinese government to use it clinically on human beings. And since then, it has been used in many countries, many regions, and especially in Korea, Japan, Italy, Spain, and all the way to Argentina, um, uh, I think to recently, I think what I know is Hong Kong. So it took about 18 years before Singapore has the first Haifu machine. This is a machine. But the knife is actually an invisible knife. The knife I call uh, uh, is the ying dao, is the So it is about from the base to the top, it's about 12 centimeters. Uh, this is a video which I took uh, when I was there in 2017 in Chongqing. Please look at this glass plate. This is where the focal point will hit the glass plate. 
and the burn is there. But if you put a hand across, there's no, there's no heat damage, there's no burn. The burn is about 12 centimeters, 13 centimeters away from the treatment, treatment basin, the treatment bowl. This is the one that focuses the heat. This is your transducer to follow, to give real time images as you operate. Another animation, which is this bowl, is this bowl. It actually ablates this, the tissues millimeters by millimeters. And any one of this is as small as three by three by five millimeters. It's very easy to remember. If you, if you play football, it's a five, three, three formation. It's three by three by five millimeters. So it's very manual, very refined, and hardly any collateral damage to surrounding tissues. I, I play a short video. After watching the video, you will understand why um, it is very advantageous to adopt or to learn this technique. So bear with me, it is only about a minute. Patient walks in. Uh, in China, patient can walk in, but in Singapore, patient is usually wheeled in. The nurses will do the monitoring. Usually there's an anesthetist or anesthetic nurse. This is Dr. Tang talking to the patient and checking with the MR image mounted on a screen. Once the, the fibro is confirmed, patient patient is comfortable and not in pain, the treatment starts. And when the treatment starts, uh, the monitoring is on this, this monitor. The, the MRI monitor, this monitor, then once it's over, the patient will just come down and go back to the ward. So after watching this short video, you will now appreciate and understand why there's actually no surgery no incision, you do not need to stay overnight if you do not want to, then there's no risk of blood transfusion as hemorrhage. You do not need a deep general anesthesia, you only need sedation. There's less collateral damage like when we do a hysterectomy, we are worried about ureters, we worry about bowel, but this one is less collateral damage because it's very sharp and very fine. The, there's minimal discomfort and future pregnancy, you do not need to worry about. From what I know, so far, there are no risks of uterine rupture. And what's more important, the uterus is preserved. And because of this, there's minimal downtime. You can go back to work, exercise, daily routine, and do whatever you normally like to do in your social life. And it costs less than a conventional myomectomy. And there's no fear of the surgical knife. And what's obvious is really is no scar. Now, it's important for me to highlight that two different kinds of HIFU. One is MRI guided, which is in which when you use, you need to be in the x-ray department where the MRI machine is, versus the ultrasound guided HIFU which give you a stronger energy burn and oblation. And the MRI guided HIFU have to be in the X-ray department, whereas the HIFU that uh, is ultrasound guided can be in a medical center or day surgery center, or you know, even in your clinic if you have the space for it. So the difference I list down here, one is the image resolution in MRI is definitely better. They have temperature monitoring. The ultrasound HIFU doesn't have a temperature monitoring, but what's important is the transducer, the working element is more flexible, has more mobility. Whereas in MRI, once you send the patient into the MRI tunnel or chamber, patient is stationary fixed there. You can't move the patient. So the patient position is quite fixed. Uh, apart from noise and all this, the treatment time is definitely longer in MRI guided HIFU compared to uh, ultrasound guided HIFU. But what is more important is MRI guided HIFU are not able to attain the perfused volume, the non-perfused volume 
that is required in uh, ablation of the fiber. So you need at least over 70%. So ultrasound guided high food usually give you 80 to 90% ablation power. Cost-wise, it's definitely more in the MRI guided high food because you depend on the MRI machine. Now, what is more important to many of us, to me especially, when I finally decided to learn ultrasound guided high food because it can be taught to any doctor. So whether you are a gynecologist, whether you're just a, a medical officer or even a radiologist, you can use this machine. Now, the major difference in ultrasound guided high food, the patient is lying prone position. Why prone means face down? Because the cooling effect is very important to bring the heat away to prevent any burns to the skin. So the face down uh, version is much better. And for MRI guided high food, the patient actually goes in the chamber. So once the patient is in the chamber, the patient and your treatment is actually blind. It's a kind of doubt. This one, the patient is outside and you can talk to the patient. So MRI guided high food is not real time. You need about 12 to 30 seconds of sonication. Uh, 12 to 30 seconds is like singing happy birthday, you know, the song twice. And 45 to 90 seconds cooling, and it goes on and on. That's why it's slower. And the bow, you see, you ask the patient not to move in MRI chamber, but that doesn't mean the bowel does not move. So we cannot guarantee the bowel doesn't come into the field of fire. That means when you treat, you press the button, it fires, the bowel may be in the way, and then you cannot see it because you, the operator is blind to it. The last count last year and 151,000 cases of ultrasound HIFU being used. Uh, only about 4,000 cases in MRI guided HIFU, and this is usually used in America or in Europe. Unfortunately, uh, when you Google, you, you, you probably go to the MRI HIFU website and they tell you it's still under experimental research and that is uh, correct for them, but not when it comes to ultrasound guided high food, when, whereby you have 151 cases already been done in the world. Now, um, ultrasound high food is now can be used for uterus, breast, liver, for control uh, and pancreatic cancer for palliative treatment, pain control. Uh, initially it was even used to treat bone cancer, but in soft tissues, uh, we use it for thyroid, we use it for uh, prostate in a man, and of course, we use it for the breast. Now, in, in gynecology, we concentrate on uterine fibroids and adenomyosis. Are there research scientific papers on HIFU? Yes, plenty. But most of us, you know, like even in, in uh, Taiwan, whereby when I have uh, meetings with my colleagues in Taiwan, all of them will quote papers from, from the West. Um, and, and sort of overlook those uh, papers we produce in Asia. Uh, a lot of papers, but it's not my duty to go into every one of them. I'm sure tonight or tomorrow, Professor Ying will be talking more on fibroid treatments and uh, versus laparoscopy. So I leave it to him. Now, why did it take so long for high food to be accepted, even in Singapore? Number one, I think it's pride. Pride in the sense that because both of us uh, uh, learn from the West, study, read English journals, so uh, the West will always think anything from Asia is uh, below them, cannot compare with them. So that is their pride. Prejudice is, uh, is, is their outlook. In other words, oh, where is this made? Oh, this was made in China. Oh dear, worse still is made in China. You know, the quality may not be there. So that is our prejudice, our bias against it. Uh, ignorance is probably like me that uh, I didn't even uh, bother to know about high food treatment for fibroids until 2017 when somebody literally dragged me to the booth to listen to the talk. That's, that's how ignorant I was. And because of this pride and prejudice, it took about 10 years for National Institute for Health and Care Excellence of UK to finally accept uh, 
the use of ultrasound guided Thai food for treatment of fibroids, 10 years. That is even after collaboration with Oxford University. I always quote this paper because it's one of the earlier papers in 2006 to 2009 about seven of over patients uh, from the Chongqing Medical University. Uh, the fibroid selected for this paper is about five centimeters to uh, 5.5 centimeters, which is a very good size to, to treat. And you can sort of attain a non-perfuse ratio or effectiveness ratio of 84%. You need something which is more than 70%. And because of that, they are able to shrink the fibroids after about one year by more than 90%. Huh? After one year or after nine months to more than 90%. And usually when I advise patients, I will say, oh, you will probably see something in three months, 30% uh, shrinkage, six months, 50% uh, shrinkage. But again, these are done by the experts uh, and these are selected fibroids. So the, the type of fibroid is really important. But we always talk about shrinkage of fibroids, how effective it is. But if we, if we think about it, the first thing we want to do is actually stop the growth of fibroids. Uh, because every, every year from 3 cm to 4 cm to 5 cm, even if we cannot shrink, the first thing we do is tell the patient that we hope to stop, stop the shrinkage of fibroids. And this is useful when you use the HIFU. Complication rates. I like to quote this tape paper, uh, which is written quite recently, 2018. And one of the authors or uh, is uh, Professor Zhang Lian, my teacher, his name is here. But this paper has 27,000 patients, one of the largest collection of uh, patients. We look at bowel injury, quoted as 0.0148%. Now, if I compare this with the normal surgery that I do, whether it's laparoscopy, bowel injury 0.04% to 0.3%. Laparotomy is about 0.8%. But if you compare this with 0.01% with HIFU, this is four times better. This is almost 30 times safer. So HIFU is, when it comes to complications, is much better. Uh, much less. There's a paper which talks about will HIFU affect the ovarian function? No, this paper is written by uh, the Korean group, published in 2017, and 79 patients treated, they measure the AMH, anti-bullerian hormone, and find that HIFU does not affect ovarian reserve. Another paper talks about does HIFU have any effect on live births? This paper is uh, written also 2017 from China. It says the conclusion is HIFU can effectively treat uh, patients with fibroids who wish to have children. It could significantly reduce the preparation period of pregnancy after operation. It can also improve fertility of patients with a history of infertility and normal pregnancy childbearing with no obstetric risk. Well, to, to summarize it, most of the time after myomectomy, we will advise the patient to wait for six months before you get pregnant for a better scar healing effect. But seemingly in high food, you can get pregnant as early as two to three months, depending on the size of the fibroid. So again, there's a big disadvantage, sorry, there's a big advantage when you use high food for fibroids, especially for those patients keen to get pregnant. Now, I just uh, got this from uh, Chung Ching. It says that so far, they've already counted more than 1,500 HIFU babies with no abnormal obstetric complications or uterine rupture. Okay, this is my, my group of doctors. Uh, all of them are my bosses. And we have the obstetricians, gynecologists, the pediatricians, and then the cancer specialists, uh, four of them are tra uh, trained in uh, HIFU. I think I'm quite short of time. We have a HIFU baby. And HIFU finally came to Singapore. And I did the first case. Uh, 
which is very exciting for me uh, because when there's a heat, when there's heat, you find that this turns white in color. So I always say, when you see these changes, yeah, like this, when you see the changes, is you're as excited as holding your girlfriend's hand for the first time. Okay, all right. Uh, I did this patient, a patient actually uh, did it her on Monday and she Wednesday, she showed me this graph of her climbing, doing rock climbing. And then five months later, she's back to a norm activity. Um, this is her MRI picture here, the fibroid. After a year, it's shrunk by so much, but what is more important, she stopped bleeding and she has normal periods. This is my picture after uh, treating a patient on the Wednesday and Saturday, she went to play golf. Okay, I'm really halfway through. I'm thinking very short of time. I'm going to rush a bit. Um, this is a classification of fibroids by FIGO, but for HIFU practitioners, HIFU doctors, we are very simple. We are talking about experience-based medicine, not evidence or um, evidence-based or evidence bias. Basically, we ask ourselves, can treat or cannot treat? If can treat, how to treat? Um, let's focus on these three. Usually, pedunculated, we will reject because pedunculated, once you treat, the, the fiber can drop off or during treatment, the bowel can come in between and there's a risk of a bowel burn. So we usually take the submucus or the intramural. This is my friend's case. After doing a uh, high food, the, the submucus fibroid just dropped out. This is my own case. After doing, the patient has found all this fibroid debris on the undergarment. And this is another patient of mine. She's smart enough to even show me uh, the fibroid that dropped out. Now, this very interesting case and how high food can actually convert an intramural fibroid to a submucous fibroid like this. Uh, this is, I, I did it in 11th April uh, 2020. Sorry, before that, I did it in July. And then nine months later, you can see that the, the fibroid is coming down. That means from uh, intramural, it becomes submucous. And two months later, I actually resected and uh, remove the fibroid for her. So you can actually convert something uh, from an uh, intramural to a submucous fibroid. Now, often, I've often been asked, will HIFU replace open surgery or invasive? The answer is no. For example, this patient with the uterus here, bladder in front, and the fibroid that's wedged between the cervix and the backbone and the rectum, I turn this down because I don't think I can safely treat this fibroid. But of course, if you have experienced uh, uh, high food doctors in Taiwan, I'm sure they can do it better than me. So I turned it down because she came to see me because the legs are always swollen on walking and standing. So what I did was the fibroid is here. You see the engorged blood vessels. The fibroid is here. The moment I laparoscopically removed the fibroid, you can see a space and find that all the blood vessels are not engorged anymore. So she's very happy that I turned her down for high food. Um, it's also very interesting. What are the other cases I turned down? If I see a bladder that is shaped like this, I'm very happy because the bladder can help me to push the intestine away. If I see a, uh, this is when I do, you see that the focal area is away from the intestine. So I'm very happy if I see this Batman sign. If I see something like a dome like this, whereby I cannot push the bladder, uh, the bowel away, like this, the bowel is always there. So when I, when I shoot, the, the waves, the sound wave, the heat may damage the bowel. So these are the cases I turn down. Just like this one, this is a Foley's catheter. The bladder is not able to push the bowel away I will turn down the case and no, you're not for Haifu. This is an, another interesting case. A patient just had laser for pigmentation on the skin. Uh, I was very, very, uh, it was early in my practice of Haifu. And because I know scars can interfere with sound waves, I also turned her down when this was just done a few days, uh, less than a week ago. So I asked her to come back about a month later when all these scars are healed, then I treat her for her, her fibroid. Huh? 
I don't think I have time to show you videos on sleeping, patient in pain, bubbles, and grayscale changes, but I'd like to skip all this and go to my last few slides. I think HIFO is very revolutionary and it will change our practice of gynae surgery. Remember, when we first started with MIS, a lot of time is difficult to even convince the, our own doctors that it works uh, and, and the patients. But once the patients are convinced, they, they prefer MIS because the, the scars are smaller. So more so now, you have something that's non-invasive with no scars at all. I think patients will be uh, in favor of this. And most important, I find that this is very good for adenomyosis. All this will be, you don't need to use when you do HIFU. All this will change. One, one important slide I want to, to, to show is, everybody knows this, this picture about uh, Dr. Amy who dies of uh, unintended upstage of the leomyosarcoma. HIFU avoids this, avoids mosculation. It is actually, the mosculator is not to be blamed. Then, you know, we started using the bags and we learned from people in the West, but to use bags and put the uh, mosculation in the bag. But I, I mean, the moment you cut into the fibroid, you already spread. You pull the fibroid out from the uterus, you already spread, you already upstage. Then you try to put the fibroid in a, in a bag. Don't you think it's like wearing a condom after sex? And furthermore, whether you have upstage the disease, the moment you take the fibroid out or you put the fibroid into the bag is also the upstage disease, the chemotherapy regime is the same. You have already upstage it. So I don't know, you put in a, in a bag actually to make yourself feel good. I don't think there's any uh, improvement in, in, in or lessening of the chemotherapy. So just my personal thought. And to put the fibroid in the bag is like COVID situation. You do everything, you know, uh, being locked down. So why, why are COVID cases less in the, in the East, in our side of uh, Asia? is because we know how to wear a mask. If you learn from the wrong people to wear a mask this way, and especially in the places where they always talk about freedom of speech, you may be in the wrong country or wrong, you have the wrong teacher. Okay. Um, all these surgeries for fibroid with the last, uh, you, you wouldn't use allipetrol acetate. Any Asian products will be less. GNRH you use because you need to string the fibroids before HIFO you need to. Contrast media MRI uh, will be being used. Uh, then what about all this? Uh, products are TCRM, TCRE, TrueClear, Vicati, Myosha will compete with HIFU or HIFU will compete with them. So will be your conventional TCRM and TCRE. Okay, yeah. the, uh, the, 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 the operating room, the major room will be less used. Uh, that was the savings to the hospital and the patient. Your anesthetic requirement will be less because uh, I understand in Taiwan, they're very short of anesthetists. So you can use anesthetic nurses to, to watch over your high full cases. Uh, you will compete with radio frequency treatment of fibroids. And of course you compete with uterine artery embolization for the treatment of fibroids. <clears throat> so whether you believe in high full or not, but I think it's good to learn something new or to refer to a department that has the HIFU facility. Uh, to me, this is uh, the spirit of, of good doctoring. And for those of you who want to learn how to use fi, uh, HIFU, remember these few um, statements. Spatial orientation, just what? You can know your north, south, east, west very well, and then, then you are one of those who can do HIFU very well. So, but if you are one of those from from office, from the hospital to home, you still use a GPS and always get lost, then maybe you have a problem. Help with ultrasound experience. If you have this experience, it's very good. Interpretation of MRI. Uh, 
this is something which most of us, especially my age group, we don't know anything about MRI, but you learn along the way. And I remember you have a very good young doctor. Her name, his name is Dr. Guo Xinghong. He gave a very nice, very nice lecture on MRI. He's in, I think he's from Taipei. Then the next thing you must understand, you must have patience. Nice thing. And abide by safety guidelines. Very important. Discipline, discipline, and discipline. I don't think I have time to go through this and what will encourage or discourage you. Uh, what I want to know is this is also part and parcel of green movement, less toxic films and less disposables. And uh, one of my concluding slides, Haifu is not arcade games, not a bowl of water with ultrasound. It is acquiring a smart virtual therapeutic system that comes with research, teaching, learning and management. So it is a whole new world of surgery that demands undivided attention, focus, judgment, and skill. So for the preservation of femininity and fertility, I think Haifu is an excellent alternative. Uh, okay, if there are any, any other things you want to know more about Haifu, I organized actually four webinars earlier this year. You can take a picture of all this and Google it on YouTube, uh, when you take a picture of this slide, please include my, my picture here. I want to be remembered. Um, yeah, it, every lecture has a laparoscopic expert and a Haifu expert to explain to you their point of view. Okay, thank you very much, Xie Xie. Uh, very excellent talk. I, I think time is limited, so I appreciate uh, Professor Li pride his appearance about the high food in the managed patient. So I think we will close this lecture. Let's thank you, Li Jianwei. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Close this lecture. Thank you. Now we move to another section.